Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to see a, a relatively slowly getting full house. We expect 40 plus people, so um, the seats will still fill up. And that's why I kind of asked everybody to kind of um, make space. But thank you very much. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ben. And Reverend uh, Bishop Jenny wishes she could be here tonight. But she only has two, two nights this summer where her three daughters are all home at the same time. And this is one of those nights. So um, she has left me to do the introducing. And so please just imagine or hear Bishop Jenny's voice in my voice. <laughs> I cannot do impersonations. So um, we are very pleased to have you all join us today on this very, very beautiful evening. So it's great that to have you out tonight. We're delighted to be professionally recording this because there are so many people at um, St. Paul's where they are interested in this topic and they might not be able to be here. They might not be able, be able to attend, but also that there are people across the country, and I'm sure that you have some students uh, that might be interested uh, through Wycliffe and through other connections, and you might be able to want to share this with others that you know. As you might know, uh, people across the country tune into St. Paul's on our YouTube channel, and so we will have a, a wide audience after uh, this is recorded. So one of the wonderful things here at St. Paul's is how diverse our congregation is and that we have people who are at all different stages of their spiritual journey and you're probably represented here. Some of you have been Christians for a long time and as long as you can remember and others of you, you're just breaking in. You're very new to our community. Maybe this is only the first or second time. Maybe you were just invited by a friend and so you're new to the church, new to Christian community. St. Paul's, we are a community that places a high value on asking questions, on learning. And so whether you are new or you're a longtime member, you are definitely welcome here. So here at the church, we follow something called the rhythm of life. Uh, you might have heard it uh, talked about, preached about, we allude to it. And it has these five ancient spiritual practices that we believe will make each of us more like Jesus. And therefore, it's the best way for us to also impact our city, to impact the world. And so part of the second rhythm is actually prayer and study and praying and reading the Bible daily, gathering regularly with others to do those two things, to pray and to study. And so tonight we are living into this second rhythm by equipping ourselves to read the Bible for all it's worth. And this is going alongside our sermon series. Um, that is coming up starting on Sunday, which is on the Ten Commandments. So a big bravo, a hand to each of you for taking the rhythm of life seriously and wanting to equip yourselves uh, for the reading of Scripture like what we're doing. So it is a delight to have uh, the Reverend Dr. Lisa Ray Beal here this evening to be our guide. She grew up near Vancouver, and her ministry and studies took her to other parts of the country, the Northwest Territories, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and here in Toronto. Her years of pastoral ministry revealed her love of preaching and teaching from the Old Testament as she responded to parishioners' desires to understand its role in Christian faith and life. So this decision informed her decision, uh, sorry, this informed her decision to pursue a PhD of Old Testament at Wycliffe College. So Wycliffe College, which is part of University of Toronto, which is not too far from here um, on, on Hoskin Avenue. And so upon graduation, she taught for many years at Providence Theological Seminary near Winnipeg. And during that time, she moved from being a part of the Pentecostal Assembly of Canada to being a part of the Anglican Church of Canada. And she ministers as, in addition to being a professor, as an ordained priest. So her research focuses on Israel's life in the land and its exile from it. And so she is currently preparing a commentary on Jeremiah. Amazing. So she lives in Toronto with her husband, Steve, whose birthday is tonight? It is. Oh, wow. And he's in Winnipeg tonight. And he's in Winnipeg. So we send our love to Steve in Winnipeg and ask for his forgiveness. Do we need to ask for his forgiveness then? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, Steve and Lisa have joined us as members of St. Paul's uh, this year, and so you might have recognized her at one of our new member Sundays, and so we are so grateful for her to give her time and her experience, her expertise to lead us. So please join me in welcoming Lisa.
Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. It's such a lovely evening out. I thought everyone would be out playing ball or something, uh, enjoying the park. So I'm blessed that you're here, uh, your excitement to uh, study the Word of God. And for me, as an Old Testament professor, I'm really excited that you guys are here to study the Old Testament because so often in our Christian life, we don't know what to do with it, or it seems very mysterious, or even worse, we sometimes think, ah, don't need it. And we do, if we really want to live the Christian life in all its fullness with growing understanding, the Old Testament, my goodness, it's like two thirds of the book, you guys. It's very important. So. Tonight we are uh, going to uh, have some time together. I will, I have a presentation for 45, 50 minutes, something like that. There'll be time for Q&A afterwards. And all of this is in preparation for the new sermon series that's starting on Sunday. And sadly, we are away on holidays on Sunday. So we will be watching it online uh, as well. But uh, in order to, to really, uh, I think, get the most out of preaching, it always is helpful if we sort of track along with that, with some, some study and some teaching that just helps as the preachers open up the Word of God. So tonight we're going to be talking about the Ten Commandments, God revealed in stone and in flesh. And I'm going to get to how that is through our time together. But first, I want you to brainstorm with me. What comes to your mind when you think of the Ten Commandments? What comes to your mind? Call something out. Ah, ha, ha, yes, yeah. Big tablets, yeah. Anything else? Ark of the Covenant, yes. Well, uh, for those of you that are of a certain age, you probably went to Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments and the, the good things about the movie, the cheesy things about that movie, oh, Hollywood big epics. Uh, for many, that's what they think about. I think more recently, uh, we think of the Ten Commandments often as public monuments. This is, I think, a little more true in the US than it is in Canada, but we're probably familiar with this reality, especially in front of courthouses and governmental buildings. You will often see the Ten Commandments there on the stone, um, judicial contexts. I think the recognition that, especially in the Western legal system, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, as they're referred to in the Hebrew Bible, uh, our Old Testament are often seen as a basis for the, much of the legal system, acknowledging the Judeo-Christian grounding of the legal system in the West. But too often, I think, when we see them on these monuments, which is often how we think of them, they are utterly abstracted from the story and they're just plunked there, sort of there. There they are, on the stone, disembodied from any tradition, any context. They're just words on stone. And I think most recently, especially again in the US, the uh, presence of them or the removal of them has been really politicized. And I think the religious uh, right has uh, been particularly involved in that. All of these, whether it's Charlton Heston or these words on stone, are actually, I think, not especially helpful, and I think often not really faithful ways of thinking about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Decalogue, all of these referring to the same thing. So in our time together this evening, we're just going to try and lay a bit of a better foundation for our thinking around the Ten Commandments, something that can better inform us and indeed form us in our Christian tradition. And the Old Testament really can do that. Here's where we're gonna to go tonight. I have basically three things that I want to share with you. Um, I'll expand them a bit, so we're not gonna be done in five minutes, but here's where we're going. 
We're going to talk first about the reality that the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Ten, are deeply embedded. They are not isolated principles frozen in time, even though we often see them stuck on a stone, immovable, principalized. But we're going to look at them as something that is deeply embedded, and deeply embedded in a narrative. We're also going to look at the Ten through this lens of them being a, an astounding self-revelation of God. And if I could jump around a lot and emphasize the astounding part, I would. But I'm afraid I'm going to fall off the edge of the platform here, so I'll, I'll try not to jump around. But to really emphasize this idea that they are an astounding revelation of God. And I'll explain a bit why that is so. And they're a revelation of God, both on stone, as we often conceptualize them, and in flesh. And we'll get to that part in a moment. And finally, I want to look at the Ten as uh, an act, should Israel adopt them? Should Israel live into them? Should we in any way do that? That doing so is a gracious response to a prior gracious act of God that sets the Ten Commandments embedded into relationship. So that's where we're going. And then at the end of all that, the so what question is really going to be, so what does it mean for me as a Christian? And I'm just going to say a couple things about that because we could be here forever otherwise. So let's look then at this first one, this idea of the ten as embedded words. The fact of the matter is that the Ten Commandments, the ten words, the directives that they're giving are actually not really anything new. We could read the biblical story starting in Genesis and we would see the same kinds of values that are reflected in the Ten Commandments, uh, affirmed in the narrative. So, you think of Cain killing Abel. The Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill, and the narrative makes it very plain that Cain killing Abel was not a good thing. Uh, we think of Canaan, who dishonors his father Noah after the flood. And again, it's made apparent in the story that this is not a good thing. Think of the Ten Commandments calling us to honor our parents. Abraham and Isaac lie, bad. Ten Commandments affirms that that is so. So they are not anything new. They shouldn't really surprise us when we get to them in the biblical story. But they're also nothing new because similar kinds of law codes or directions for living were circulating in the ancient world. And they do contain some of the same kinds of ideas that we see in the Ten Commandments. So they're really embedded in their ancient Near Eastern context, the area from Egypt through the land of Palestine and Israel and over into Mesopotamia and Babylon, they're all dealing with some similar kinds of concerns. What is new about the Ten is that they are a, a clear and succinct expression of a basis for action that we don't see in any of the other law codes uh, extant or still uh, available to us from that ancient world. So they're, they're nothing new, but they're something incredibly new in the ancient world. They're embedded words. Where do they show up? Don't look at the sheet on the chair that you picked up. There's, they show up in two places. Can anyone tell us where they first show up? Yes, boom, both of them, Exodus 20. And that's right after they have uh, exited, been busted out of the prison of Egypt, and God has taken them through the Red Sea, and they've come down to Mount Sinai, and they're there to worship God. 
And in Exodus 19, it sort of introduces what's going to happen. And then in Exodus 20, the 10 words, the 10 commandments are given. They also appear again in Deuteronomy. Anyone know the chapter? Deuteronomy 5 is where they show up. This is by the time they have gone through the wilderness and they're on the east side of the Jordan and Moses is preparing them to enter into the land. And he reminds them, tells them again of the Ten Commandments and how central they are to their life in the land as they're preparing to go in. So these ten words are far from being isolated principles, but instead they're deeply embedded in the narrative that stretches all the way from the garden through to the book of Deuteronomy and beyond. Because while they show up in the context of Israel being released out of the prison of Egypt and becoming God's people at Mount Sinai, and then in Deuteronomy, preparing to go into the land, they're embedded in that story. And we don't really understand what they're all about if we excise them from that story and see them as isolated principles. They actually arise out of God's desire to right the wrong that happened in Genesis 3 with what we call the fall. This is one of the ways that God is going to address that terrible thing that happened in the garden. They actually respond to the promise that God made to Abraham, that through Abraham's descendants, blessing would come to, to everyone, in, including us today. They're part of that story. They will govern the people's life in the land. Ben was saying that I'm working on the book of Jeremiah these days as they're being taken out of the land. And one of the reasons that the book of Jeremiah says God is removing them into exile is that they failed so miserably to live into the Ten Commandments. So these 10 words sort of head up the expression of what we often call the law. Now, honestly, when you think of the law, what do you think of getting a, a ticket for speeding, uh, having to pay your taxes, that's a law, all kinds of do's and don'ts, right? You can't do these things, you should do these things. But when we think of the Ten Commandments introducing the law in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we actually start thinking of the, the law for Israel as a do's and don'ts list. And instead, it's really, the Hebrew word is Torah, instruction, how to be the people of God, how to enjoy his presence, how to live well in the story that he's telling through the life of Israel. So these 10 words are introducing uh, the, the Torah, the instruction, how to be the people of God, uh, part of this grand story that God is telling through them and to them. So these are deeply embedded words and they're embedded in the great event of the Old Testament. What is the most astounding event of the Old Testament? What would you say? Exodus. Yes, yeah. The Exodus. It is the event of the Old Testament that the Old Testament itself is constantly referring back to. And it is that story in which the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, are embedded. The Ten Commandments start with the preamble, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That takes us right back, certainly to the beginning of Genesis, but more closer, it takes us back to the beginning of Exodus. And 19 chapters of them being busted out, saved from the power of Egypt, 
taken out of the land of the Pharaoh and being brought down to Mount Sinai. It tells us, as we start the 10, that something wonderful has happened, that they have been saved. When they were slaves in Egypt, powerless to do anything, they were saved out of that. And it tells us who did that. It wasn't Baal, it wasn't Asherah, it wasn't any of the gods of Egypt. It was the God who was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And these 10 words are stuck in that story. And you can understand them fully if you just take them out, set them on stone, make them isolated principles. They are self-revealing words, not just embedded in the story, out of which we understand the 10 words, but out of the 10 and out of that story, they reveal something of who God is. We know his name, Yahweh, which in your English Bibles is, see the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's in your English Bible, typically how they will um, uh, represent the mysterious name of God that was revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. He says, I am the Lord your God. This is who I am. This is who's uh, talking to you. And I am the one who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, this is astounding. And you think, well, I, I read it in my Bible. I've read it many times. What's so astounding about that? Well, let me tell you that if you were a typical ancient Near Eastern person, here's a, a very small selection of gods and goddesses that you could pick. And you could worship any of these if you wanted to. And there's many, many more than these. But the problem is, in the ancient world, when you picked a god or a goddess to worship, you wanted to live your life in such a way that they would be nice to you. And the problem is they typically didn't tell you what you needed to do or not do to gain the favor of a particular god or goddess. We know that that is so because we actually have a prayer from an ancient worshiper from that time, so not an Israelite, someone from one of the surrounding nations, and something had gone wrong in their life, and they didn't know what God was mad at them, and they didn't know what on earth they had done to be made sick, because that's what they thought the gods did to punish them, and they didn't have a clue what they needed to do to change things. Let me read you just a short portion of the prayer. If I read you the whole thing, it's about three pages long. That's how distressed they are. Let me read you this. May my Lord's angry heart be reconciled. May the God I do not know be reconciled. May the goddess I don't know be reconciled. May the God, whoever he is, be reconciled. O oh my Lord, many are my wrongs, great are my sins. O oh my God, many are my wrongs, great are my sins. O oh my Goddess, many are my wrongs, great are my sins. O oh God, whoever you are, many are my wrongs, great are my sins. O oh Goddess, whoever you are, many are my wrongs, great are my sins. I don't know what wrong I've done. I don't know what sin I have committed. I don't know what abomination I have perpetrated. I don't know what taboo I have violated. That's the world in which Israel lived. A world in which the gods, the goddesses, didn't reveal themselves, didn't tell you what uh, they liked you to do or not do, and certainly didn't let you know when you'd screwed up unless they came along and bopped you, killed you, perhaps. That was a mindset of the ancient world. So in that context, this is astounding that this God who has cared enough about the people to rescue them 
out of slavery, now comes and says, hey, this is my name. This is the kind of God that I am. I'm the kind of God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And I'm going to reveal to you who I am through what I consider important, the things that I value. And that's what we see in the 10 words. We're not stuck trying to appease some unknown deity. We are, Israel is met by a God who rescues them. That's an astounding act. Who tells them his name. And he says, this is the kind of God I am. I'm a God who brings you out. And these are the things that I value for your lives. And he gives them the 10 words as a sampling of his wisdom, things that God cared deeply about so that it's almost like it's a primer for them as to what is close to God's heart. And in reading and remembering and reciting and seeking to live by the 10 words, Israel was walking into the wisdom of God. This is a good life. This is a life of wholeness, of shalom, of peace, of fulfillment, of connectedness to God. Now, this is where you pull out the thing that was on your seat. And for those of you on YouTube, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20, and this is what we're looking at here, the Ten Commandments. I have just a little piece of information. You'll notice it's exactly the same on either side. Uh, they're, both columns are from Exodus chapter 20. So it's the same representation of the Ten Commandments. But in the Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments have been numbered differently. So the original Hebrew doesn't say uh, Commandment 1, Commandment 2, Commandment 3. It just gives you the words. And so uh, the Christian churches have sometimes divided them up differently. And I've just provided that there for you because some of you may have Bibles that seem to group them a little differently. And the big difference is between, on the left-hand side, between Commandment 1 and 2. In some of the Christian traditions, like the Catholic tradition, uh, one and two are the first commandment. So nothing else changes, but just how they think about it. It has some ramifications for um, how they think about um, living out their uh, church life and so on, how they think of God. But beyond that, nothing more. So you can even fold it in half, and we're going to look at this side, because we're in the Anglican side of <laughs> the page. So this is a primer of what is close to God's heart, something that shows his wisdom, something that invites them into a life of wholeness, of peacefulness, of shalom. The 10 do not answer every specific legal situation. There's just 10 of them. But it gives a broad picture of the kinds of things that are close to God's heart and what he cares about. And it's in places after the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy and other places that those um, uh, foci, those, those things that are important to God are, are then spelled out within the context of the life of ancient Israel. But what I'd like to just point out to you is that this life, this wise life of Shalom, where does it begin? Just like Proverbs says, yeah, it begins with attention to God. First one, you shall have no other gods before me. Second one, don't make an idol. They lived in a culture where idols were everywhere. Third one, don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. A, a better way to think about that is the idea of not carrying or bearing the name of God in a worthless way. The fourth one, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Those first four ones are all focused towards God. Who he is, how you worship him, uh, how you honor him. 
the life of shalom, the wisdom of God, gets nowhere if it doesn't start with him, isn't focused on him. And it's only after that, that in Numbers 5 through 10, we start talking about other kinds of relationships, familial relationships, the relationships of um, the world around us, uh, how we deal with life and sex and property. All those kinds of things are at least touched on in some way in the 10. So this self-revealing word of God reveals not just who he is, I am the Lord, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt from the place of slavery, but reveals his character by addressing the things that are important to this life of shalom that God envisioned for us back in the garden. And he says to his people, Israel, you can enter into that and enjoy that. And if you do, and if you want that, then it begins with God, focusing your life on him, Israel, in the context of nations that are worshiping any God under the sun and under the ground. He says, this is who I am, the one who rescued you, the one who redeemed you, the one who actually wants you to know what is near and dear to me. I don't want to keep you guessing. The one who actually envisions for his people a life of shalom, of, of wholeness, of fullness. These are the self-revealing words of God. If you actually look at the book of Deuteronomy, and the Ten Words, or the Ten Commandments, show up in chapter 5, and we can actually, if we have me come back sometime, and I'll teach you the book of Deuteronomy. It's so exciting. And I know, that's the one that you read when you need to, you can't sleep at night. <laughs> No, yeah. But in the book of Deuteronomy, the, the ten words are presented in chapter 5, and then from chapter 6 through 26, the chapters are unfolding and sequentially dealing with each of the ten commandments in a variety of ways, saying, this is how it would look like in this kind of context. This is how it would look like in the ancient world, Israel, that you inhabit. This is how you live out this life of shalom, of wholeness. Let me pause there a moment. Are, do you have any questions at this point before we move on? Yes, nice and loud, because this tall room and my bad hearing is... Yeah, they, they actually, the preamble that I talked about, I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, for them that is the first one. Yeah. So there's still just ten, but they sort of slice and dice them a little differently so that um, all the material is there that is there for us in our conception of the Ten Commandments. They just number them a little differently. Great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions before we move on? Mm -hmm. Our culture seems to view the Ten Commandments as uh, wagging fingers, oh, yeah. threatening punishment. Yeah. But yeah. they're presenting them as an invitation to a rich and healthy life. Yes. How do we present that? The life of Shalom. See, that's what happens when we excise them from the story and put them as a monument. We just see them as a disembodied, you know, rule of life. Oh, isn't that nice? Um, yeah, but when we see it embedded in the story of God redeeming his people and saying, here I am, this is who I am, and this is how I want you to live with me, then I think it takes on a very different tone. And especially when we understand that the ancient Near Eastern gods, they were the ones that were ready to whap you. Uh, you stepped out of line, whack. You, oh, pow. Not so this God. And I think when your, your God comes to you 
comes to Israel and says, guess what? One of the first things I'm going to do is redeem you out of slavery. Wow. That positions me differently towards him. I'm kind of interested in this God. I'd like to get to know this God a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and so the, the idolatry that we have today, I mean, in some parts of the world, there's still, you would still bow down to a, a, a handcrafted wood or stone idol. Um, I don't see that much here in Toronto, but I see all kinds of other things that we bow down to, that we give our allegiance to. Um, and my goodness, the stock market will whack you just as... Uh, well is one of those ancient Near Eastern deities without much warning. So that's certainly one of the deities that we bow down to, I would say. Yeah. Anyone else before we go on? Um, early in Deuteronomy, isn't there a p part where the other people looked at the, pe the children of Israel and said, you know, there's some merit in them having just one God. Yeah. Why can't we be like them? But Unlike you, I can't give you the chapter and verse. Yeah, so in Deuteronomy, there is, a, in chapter 4, uh, as Moses is, uh, as a presentation of Moses is speaking to the people, and he says something like, and now I'm paraphrasing here, what other nation has a God so wonderful as this? What other nation has laws so great, has instruction so great as ours? And you, you can hear his excitement. He would be like, okay, you guys, I used to be in Pentecost, and you know the Pentecostal uh, stereotype of, oh, wow, so exciting. He's, he's that kind of preacher, I think. He, he wants people to know how wonderful this God is that has rescued them and revealed himself to them by name, and through, by his character, through his actions, by his character, through what he names in the 10 words as near and dear to his heart for people to live into this life of shalom. Yeah, great question, yeah. You offered a, is this more appropriate translation of commandment number three? Yes. Using the word saying this, it's carrying in it. In a yeah, place. yeah. So, just could you to expand on that a little? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah. So. so what's happening with that is what I've given, so the, the question is on the um, third commandment, which typically we think about don't swear or, you know, don't make vows or something like that. If you actually translate what the Hebrew says, you get the more literal reading that I've given. You shall not bear or, or carry or, or hold up in front of others is the idea, the name of the Lord your God in vain or worthlessly. And at this point, I'm going to give a, a plug. It's not a shameless plug because this is not my book, but the, this is a book of Carmen Joy Imes, uh, written a few years back, and she actually really delves into that reality. Um, and it's, it's um, a, 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 a plain translation of the Hebrew, and I think it makes total sense this idea of um, the first three, uh, first two commandments, this is who I am, don't worship idols. And then the third one, don't misrepresent God. Don't bear his name worthlessly. Don't hold it out in front of others in a way that is vain. Uh, that's sort of the idea, I think, of what the third commandment is getting at. So I, I would actually commend this book to you. I had suggested the church get it, and I, I was thrilled when I came in and saw it. So um, if you're interested, I think it's $30. You can pick it up afterwards. Thank you for that question. I would really love to spend more time on that, and I get at it a bit in where we're going to go next. Because not only are the 10 embedded words and words in which God is revealing himself but they are also words that call us and called Israel to respond. And I would say to respond with a, a response of grace because God presents himself graciously to the people. So the call is issued. 
this call to respond to the ten words, is issued by a God who has redeemed them when they were without hope and without help in Egypt. In the New Testament, that is parallel to our own salvation. So the Exodus event is like us being rescued out of the realm of darkness, out of the, the Pharaoh, the Satan as Pharaoh figure, and being translated through baptism into new life. But this is the God who says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And then he calls them to live in a certain way. And that means that they are not saved because they live a certain way that pleases God. They were saved out of Egypt before God says, and this is how I want you to live so as to honor me. So the Ten Commandments, the Torah, the law of God was never then and should not now ever be considered as a way the people were saved or came to faith in God. That's backwards because they are rescued out of Egypt first. And only after that does God say, hey, look what I did. And now here's how I want you to live. Not so you would be saved. They've already been saved. But so that you would live responsively towards this God who has rescued you. Same with us today. We are saved, not because of anything we have done, but then we are asked to live in ways that are pleasing to God in gracious and grateful response to what he has done. Same then, same now. So if you are told, as Israel was, I'm the Lord your God who brought you up to the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you had no way to save yourselves, I'd be thinking, oh, wow, hmm. And then he goes on and he makes a covenant with them. And in that covenant, this is a, a relationship by which the two parties are bound together and committed to one another. The prophets think of it as intimate as marriage. God makes a covenant with the people of Israel. And he says to them, I am your God, you are my people. You see the reciprocity there. That's how tightly bound. I belong to you and you belong to me. That's what we call the covenant formula. I am your God and you are my people. And all the way through the Old Testament, we see that formula describing what the relationship between God and the people he redeemed should be. I am your God, you're my people. Uh, tight, like this. And Israel is invited into that. That's astounding. No other nation has that offered to them by their deities. But it gets even better. If that isn't good enough, God says in Exodus 19, as he brings them to Mount Sinai, and they're getting ready to receive the 10 words, he says, you know, all the nations belong to me. Exodus 19, verse 5. But Israel, I want you to be in this covenant with me, tight like this, and you're going to be special. You're going to be my treasure. And, and the word there, treasure, treasure is seg segula. And it's the idea of the treasure of a king. You think of a, a king with all the gold and silver in his treasury. That's how special God makes Israel. Now, if all of those special things were said to me or to you as they were to ancient Israel, here's gifts, grace gifts, salvation, rescue out of Egypt. Here's the gift of knowing who I am. Here's the gift of showing you what life could be like. How would you want to respond to that? I want in. I would want to receive that. And I think that is exactly the point. 
is that if you are showered with all of this grace, why would you say, Would you not? Doesn't it make sense to say, I want to know this God. I want to respond to this God. I want to be his people. I want to be in covenant with him. I want to live uh, responsively and be a treasured possession. I want to bear his name. I want to show his name to all the world around me so that I know, and God knows, and the people know that I'm so delighted at what I have received that it changes how I live. And that's the point for Israel. Not just that they would live differently, but that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Not just so they could pat themselves on the back and feel good about it, but for the purpose of showing the world. See how great our God is? You can look at me and I'll help point you to this deity. You don't have to worry about Baal and Asherah. You don't have to be in slavery to those other idols. Here's a God who wants to redeem you. Here's a God who wants to invite you into a life of wholeness and shalom. Here's a God that can make you a treasured possession. Come, respond, and live in such a way that other people want to be brought into that relationship. And that's exactly what the people do. In Exodus 24, the law has been given. God has invited them into that covenant. I am your God, you are my people. And the people, it's almost you can hear their excitement. Everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. We're in. We want to live in these ways to show that God has been gracious and we're going to respond in gratitude. Of course, they don't always follow through on that, do they? And they often get it wrong, but they want to be God's people, living in his shalom and showing that to all the world drawing others to this God. So this is where we've come from in this brief time together. And this is the question. So what? Does the Old Testament 10 words really mean anything for my life now? Can I just cut off the Old Testament and just the new is enough? If they're given for Israel, can we disregard them now simply because we are Christian? And you know what I'm going to say. No, 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 and no. Because the Christian witness is that the Old Testament, as we would call it, is our scripture. And it is our story. We're, we're now part of that story. And it's necessary for our Christian life to know that story. And haven't we learned a lot just from hearing how God has interacted with Israel? That he took these 10 words and he embedded them in a story. That he took these 10 words and revealed himself to the people. That he gave them the 10 words and the invitation was, Come and live this way, in responsiveness, in, in gratitude, in uh, mutual uh, interaction together. And all of that instructs us, I think, how to live our own Christian lives. Because we have been rescued out of Egypt, our old life of sin. And we have been brought through the Red Sea and baptism as the church makes that correlation. And God doesn't then say, now here's a list of do's and don'ts. What a killjoy that would be. Who wants that? But he says, do you realize what you've received? Live responsively and joyfully as my witnesses, living out what is important to me 
in your own lives and in the life of the world around you and in the life of the church. That we can be bearers of the name. We, we can show who he is by how we live. And the good news is for us as Christians that there's only one person ever in all the world who did it right, who got the 10 words and really fully lived them. And you know the answer, it's the Sunday school answer, Jesus, yes, yeah. He is the God that is revealed in the 10 words. He's the same God that we meet in the Old Testament this is a God that is now incarnated in the Son, in Jesus, and he lived the 10 words perfectly. And the great good news is that you and I, as Christians, we have died, and our life is hidden in Jesus. And that helps us live out the, 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 the values of the 10 words. To, to live them out joyfully, to puzzle together about how does this commandment, how, how does this particular value of God work in our society? Because we're not living in ancient Israel. And Jesus and our life in him helps us do that. So that's what I'd like to leave you with. And open time for questions there's so much more we could have said, and I've tried to sort of keep my, I, I can really get going with the Old Testament because I want everyone to love it as much as I do. But are there questions and places where you'd like me to maybe delve in a bit more deeply? Clarification or wondering what does it matter for our life today? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for that presentation. I have a question on the second commandment yeah um just one specific part where it says i the lord your god am a jealous god punishing the children for the sin of the fathers the third and fourth generation yeah i'm just wondering if you can comment on why that's just and what what are your thoughts there yeah okay thank you so the question is in the uh second commandment where it says I'm the Lord your God, and I punish uh, to the third and fourth generation. But then notice as well that he says, but showing love to a thousand generations. So I, I think there's two things going on here, Abodia, that I would uh, think are important for us in the time that we have. One is that there is an element of hyperbole going on here to show how uh, egregious sin is, to show how damaging sin is that it has spin on effects. And I think that's part of this idea of God punishing to the third and fourth generation. That, that sin, what is it? The wages of sin is death, as Paul says, and sin has consequences and they're heavy often and they have spin on effects. But there is some hyperbole there because then it's balanced out, overbalanced with, but I show, what does it say? Love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So there is some hyperbole there in that contrast. But I think it is also true, secondly, that I, I think of this, the sins of my own forebears in my family and how I've seen that they do have effect down generations. Uh, not in some cursed way, but my grandfather did certain things that damaged uh, his children, and that uh, came out in some of the ways that I was raised. And God has, you know, God always graciously brings release and healing and so on and so forth. So it's not as if we're doomed to pass that on forever. So I think those are a couple things I might respond to that wonderful question. Thank you. Any other questions? In those days, people won't say parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. 
but everybody dies for their own sins. So is that yeah. like the promise of fulfillment that yeah. punishment isn't going to keep going on and on? Yeah, and, and he's speaking to, into another context. There's other issues going on, but also pointing to the reality that I, I'm not... Uh, um, uh, my forebear sins are theirs, and my sins are mine, but the effects can, I think, continue on. Yeah. Thank you. And that's why, uh, Cindy, I might also add that it's so important that we read the whole of Scripture because it, it looks at these realities from different perspectives and speaking into different situations. So we have to sort of hold those things together. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, when Jesus speaks in the New Testament of loving God as being the most important commandment, where do we see that love kind of in the wording of the old? Is it a translation issue or is Yeah, so the, the love that Jesus is speaking of is the covenant. So um, this is a God who, when uh, be, he, he calls it, so let's, let's go back further. This is a, the love of God is that he hangs in. So the, the fall happens, and he, if I was God, I would have wiped everyone out and started over. Aren't you glad I'm not God? But he hangs in, and he's got a plan. He knows where he's going. And of all the silly things, he chooses one man, Abraham, old, too old to have children. His wife is barren. Um, and he starts working out his plan, and he, he hangs in with his people, even when repeatedly they thumb their nose at him. They want the benefits of covenant, but they don't want to follow through in responsiveness. And he hangs in with them for centuries and centuries and centuries. That, I think, is the love of the Old Testament, or one of the ways that it is illustrated. And I think in the 10 words, it's illustrated in that God says, this is who I am, and this is what I think is important for a flourishing life and a witnessing life. Um, in the ancient world, that's astounding that a deity would do that. Great question. Yeah. Yes. So I also have a question uh, that actually pertains to the New Testament, if that's, uh, <laughs> if that's acceptable. So my question is specifically about the uh, commandment about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. But what I'm thinking about is, so Jesus makes extensive reference to the Ten Commandments in the Gospels, yeah. particularly I'm thinking yeah. of on the Sermon on the Mount. He, to my recollection at least, talks about, uh, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, and you've heard it said, not, do not commit murder. And in both cases, and if, there's, if he mentions other commandments as well, I'm sure it would be the same, he actually raises the bar for us, right? So he says, you've heard it said, do not yeah. commit murder, but I say, if you even, uh, yeah, say raka to your brother, that's, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Um, now, I'd contrast that with the remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Jesus is frequently coming into conflict with the Pharisees, Mm -hmm. because he's usually healing somebody on the Sabbath, yes. and yeah. they're not fans of that. So uh, I, of course, very much agree with you that the Ten Commandments, we are still bound as Christians to the Ten Commandments in a way that we are not necessarily to some of the more um, ritualistic yeah. laws the, in the, the book of Leviticus. Laws and so on and so forth. But yeah. what would be your interpretation for Christians of how do we honor the Sabbath and keep it holy in sort of a uniquely... Christian way that is not falling into sort of the trap of the Pharisees. Yeah. The, the, the sermon that I was asked to preach that I really wish I could go back and do, this is years later, was a sermon on they wanted me to talk about the Sabbath and I didn't like what I said. And I'm not sure that, I think I, I hope I say something that I'm a little more pleased with next week when I reflect back on this. But I, I think two, two things again. One is that there is a principle uh, in the idea of Sabbath that says, I will actually step back from my frenetic activity as a, a, a way to acknowledge the reality of God and that I can stop working and God still cares for me. He cares for the world. Uh, I don't have to be bound 
to that frenetic activity. And I think uh, whether we observe the Sabbath uh, by actually doing that or not, that's a wonderful principle to reflect on. How can I keep Sabbath? Some people actually stop work. There, there's certain things they, they don't do. I had a, a pastor and he would never watch sports on Sunday because for him, that was one of the ways he acknowledged uh, there needs to be time in my life to really step back and worship God and let the cares of the world fade a little bit. But uh, there are other ways to keep Sabbath. It could be another day that you mark, or it could be a practice. So maybe you decide I'm going to on Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon or Friday afternoon, go and go for a walk. Interestingly, when we look in uh, Hebrews chapter three and four, where it's talking about the Sabbath and that we as Christians have entered into Sabbath rest. And I think there we begin to see a bit of um, the, the New Testament taking that Sabbath command that it needs to be a particular day, which for Jews is Saturday, and begins to say, you know, in the Christian reality and in the life of the Spirit, we are in Sabbath because we really are, we've died, our life is hidden with Christ and God. I don't have to strive. I am in Christ. That's my identity. And so maybe I don't need to take a particular day or have particular practices, but instead to walk in my life with this growing sense of, I am in the Sabbath of God because I am in Christ. So the New Testament begins to uh, reformulate and rethink around that idea. And I think both uh, the observance of a day and particular practices or not doing that, but walking in the reality of who we are in Christ can be wonderfully Christian ways to enter into the practice and the mindset of Sabbath. And we don't want to make either of those legalistic because then we sort of blow up the idea of Sabbath. That's the sermon I wished I'd have preached years and years ago, or something maybe like that. Yes. Is, is that what Jesus means when he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it? Is that it's more that we're moving in rhythms of grace rather than legalistic? Jesus? Yeah, yeah. C certainly, I, I, I think this idea of Jesus as the fulfillment of the law does two things. One, it tells us, as Paul says, that the law is holy and just and good. But in Jesus fulfilling it, he sort of, he becomes the new law for us. He becomes the, the new Moses teaching the law and he's teaching the law of the spirit. Now the law of the spirit calls us to all these 10. Um, you spoke about sort of raising the bar and, and I think the law of the spirit is boy, if I had to keep that on my own strength, um, but it's the law of the Spirit and died and hidden with Christ in God, uh, that's where the, the freedom to, to seek to live that out by his power, um, I, I think adds something new to, I think, the, the, the righteous ancient Israelite who with joy in their heart was seeking to live by the law, not as a duty, not as a constriction, but as an expression of, I am so amazed at what you have done and who you are. I want to try as best I can to live my life to please you. And when I blow it, thank you, you've given me all kinds of sac sacrifices I can make and restitutions I can make so that I don't have to be bound. They weren't bound, we're not bound. God calls people to a life of freedom, of shalom and wholeness, but it is a life of responsibility of witness and a life I think that is a responsibility of if you wanna be in the covenant and enjoy its benefits, then there are responsibilities of how we live, so. 
Anyone else? Yes, at the back, nice and loud. I want to draw a parallel, that, a parallel that may not be valid. We refer to them as the children of Israel. Yes. And Jesus said often, you know, the, the, it's easier for a child to enter the kingdom of heaven than just about anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I was brought up to believe that children need rules. The, I'm, the children... children need rules yeah. for their lives. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I'm drawing a, a parallel. I'm just manufacturing yeah. so, it. So this... thank you. What a good thing. And I meant to say this in, uh, earlier in our time together, that the, the, the Ten Commandments and the Torah, all sort of the legal material, and the life of the spirit, so that we live by the law of the spirit, is not just freedom to ah, do whatever you want. It's the freedom that a parent gives to a child when they say, there's a really nasty dog down the street, so young toddler, I want you to just play in our backyard. There's a safe fence there. Um, I don't want you to eat yellow snow. I don't want you to touch the hot stove. We, we put boundaries and, and rules so that the, the life of that child will flourish and uh, grow to the point that they um, set those boundaries, they receive those boundaries and they can set them for themselves as well. So thank you, very good point. I meant to mention that earlier, so. Okay, let me hand it back to Ben then. Thank you so much, this has been- uh, Can we give a hand to Lisa? A very deep thank you from from so many of us and I know that those that are going to watch online will also benefit from from this and, and enriching our understanding of the Old Testament especially these ten words yeah. yes I hope it helps as we uh, enter into this new sermon series looking forward to yeah. it I'm gonna say a word of prayer for us as before we go and uh, and obviously uh, Lisa's here to chat with anybody who has some, some deeper questions or some other things that they want to ask. And we do have the books that are outside that if you want to um, pick up a copy of that just to enrich and deepen your understanding of that. Um, so um, let me say a word of prayer for us as we, we close our night. Lord God, we thank you that you have given words to us, you speak to us, and that that is one of the ways in which you show us who you are and how much you love us. And so, Lord, these, uh, these words that you've given us, they are meant to bring us life, and uh, they are not meant to save us. You have already done that. So, Lord, we just thank you that uh, we, can, um, we have these, these words, these ancient words that are um, so life-giving to us and that we can uh, hold on to them. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we just want to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.